Professor, um, we might call this uh, a biography of your curiosity. So I want to see some of the origins of your curiosity, perhaps in childhood, uh, the kinds of books you might have been reading, the, uh, the kind of child you were okay. uh, intellectually. Um, Where are we, first of all, in your childhood? Let's see. Uh, I guess I'm about five. Let's start at about five. Okay. I... And, and where is the location? I'm on a bus coming home from school in the countryside. Okay. My in the English countryside. In the English countryside. Yes. My mother was a school teacher. Ah. She's the headmistress of a little school um, in the countryside about 10 miles outside of Bristol in the UK. Ah, okay. And I went to the, the school that, where she was headmistress. Oh, which is a nightmare. Um, it had some disadvantages. <laughs> Occasionally the kids would surround me in the play playground and explain to me that I had to persuade my mother to do certain things. <laughs> it's always the kids um, that make it a nightmare, yes. But it wasn't too bad. But uh, you survived that. Um, I survived that. So you're five on a bus. I'm five on a bus and it, the bus has um, velvet seats, that is seats covered with a material that's um, got a heavy pile. Uh -huh. And I'm sitting on the bus and I put a penny, and old British pennies were big, I put a yes, penny down them. on the yeah. velvet seat and it moved and it went uphill. <laughs> And this was clearly impossible. And I was absolutely fascinated by the fact that you put this penny down. It wouldn't always do it, but sometimes it would go uphill. And it's a bit like those dreams you have. I guess I have, not everybody has, but I think a lot of people have them. When you suddenly discover you can fly. And yeah. in the dream, yes. you think this can't be real. Yes, yes. Um, but you try it again. And it, you can fly and it's amazing and you know it can't quite be real but it's just amazing and it's wonderful that you can fly. Well this penny moving uphill was the same kind of thing. It was sort of weird and wonderful um, like the first time you discover magnetism uh -huh. and I couldn't believe what was happening and at the time I just was amazed by it and I was puzzled by it for a long long time. And possibly a little experimental. You tried it a few times. I tried it a few times and it didn't work reliably, but it did work. <laughs> um, and I remembered a lot about the circumstances on that bus. I, don't, I remember which side of the bus we were sitting on. Yes, yes. And where in the bus we were sitting. You... Um, for years, I just didn't understand how this penny had gone uphill. And it was a sort of lurking memory that was this weird thing that had happened that couldn't possibly have happened. Wonderful. Now, did you rush to the nearest adult and say, I've noticed this? Uh, can you help me understand why, or did you just keep no, the No, I guess problem? if I was, yeah, I'm not that kind of a person. I want to figure it out myself. Um, okay, okay, exactly. And so I just couldn't figure it out. It did just you didn't make any sense. And, but it stayed in my mind. And, and I think my, a lot of my research career is like that. There's these little niggly things that don't make any sense, and they just stay in my mind. Wonderful. And with this, when I was a teenager, and I guess when I studied physics at school, although you wouldn't need to study physics for this, I finally understood what must have been happening. Because the other thing I remember about the bus was, it vibrated a lot. It had an engine, a big engine at the front, that was somehow loose, that made the whole bus vibrate. Yes. And so clearly what was happening was, the flock on the material was at an angle, and it was an angle facing upwards. Yes. So it was slip. Yes. The seat was kind of like this and the flock was like this. Right. And so the penny couldn't go down. So when it vibrated, um, when it vibrated this way, it would go up and it couldn't vibrate down. So that was what was making, yeah, it, was it, a, making it move up. Did you actually <laughs> pursue the problem eventually? Or no, it just came to me one it day. It just came to you. Um, when I understood enough about um, things like valves, I guess. I, I'm going to boringly jump to a more formal part of your education, although that was, that was the gem of, of, of understanding your, your curiosity. But um, are you getting a good education? Are you in a, um, 
well, there's the, the school your, your mother is headmistress of, but then the next level, are you getting teaching in science? Are you finding teachers that interest you? Um, yes and no. Yes, so, please. Uh, I was at my mother's school in the countryside, um, which was mainly children of farmers. Yes. And had a ve they had a very strong Somerset accent. Yes. Um, there's actually quite a lot of German in the Somerset. Um, they use words that sound German to me, and I think they must be German in origin. Um, and so I had this very strong agricultural accent, uh -huh. and I, when my mother got pregnant with my younger sister, she had to leave the school, so she would have been, I'd been about six then. Yes. Just yes. turning six, I think. And I went to a primary school in, near, near where I lived. And then um, my parents wanted me to go to the grammar school, which had a, it had a sort of junior school. I can't remember what age, but um, and I sat an exam for the grammar school and I failed it. <laughs> um, so then my parents decided to send me to the, a private school, um, a school I never liked. Uh, it was called Clifton College. Yes, um, yes, yes, I know it. And they wouldn't let me in. I mean, they were willing to take me in the um, junior school, but the, pre the prep school it was called, preparation for the big school. Um, but they said I couldn't come until something had been done about my accent. Your accent was my the accent. problem. I wasn't allowed into the school because of my accent. And they said I'd have to stay in the primary school for another year until my accent had been fixed. Um, May I call that an only in England situation? Maybe. I don't know enough about other right, cultures. Fair enough. Um, All right. So you went about improving your accent or your, your parents? I just did? hang. I mean, at home, the accent was fine. Yes. Um, but you had the school accent the summer like, set. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. And in the local primary school, my accent became more acceptable. Right. And then I went to this prep school. Um, and it was a British prep school. Uh, I didn't like it. Um, I was completely out of place and isolated there oh, yeah. because my father was a Stalinist. My oh. mother was a staunch Labour Party supporter. Yes. She so was the secretary of the local Labour Party. Oh. Um, so you were a class I'd been enemy. Taught, I'd, be, I'd been taught that um, religion was just nonsense. Yes. Um, something I still believe. And I mean, it's just patently nonsense. And this was a sort of, I call it muscular Christianity. That is, it wasn't sort of particularly religious, but it was a Christian school. And they thought, yes. they thought the things that were good for boys were things like playing, rug, playing rugger and right. go, going to church. And so we had to go to a service every morning. Um, and I felt, well, years later at the service in the morning when I was much older, when I was a teenager, um, we, I also had to come in on Sundays because I lived at home. Most of the kids in the school were boarders who lived in the school, but maybe sort of 20% of the school were day boys who lived in Bristol. Yes. Um, and we had to come in on Sundays for yeah, a proper was, service on Sundays. There was no excusing your absence. You couldn't just be at home on Sundays, so right. I had to walk in on Sundays for this service. <laughs> and they would invite headmasters of other schools to come and give sermons. And I remember a headmaster of another school um, 
giving a sermon about how awful Russia was and how they had um, forced ideological education in Marxism and people had to sort of, they weren't, they couldn't be excused, they had to sit there and they had to listen to this Marxist nonsense um, forcibly. And I remember sitting there thinking, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm forcibly listening to this religious nonsense. Um, <laughs> and I almost got up and walked out and I somehow wish I had, I'd have been thrown out of the school, but I wish I'd done that. Um, Few would have had the courage to do it. I didn't. I didn't. Um, is no one, is, is no one noticing your intelligence in this muscular school? No, um, there were some people who, um, some teachers who um, were very nice to me. There was a math teacher uh -huh. called S.T.P. Wells in uh -huh. the, I, I have no idea what his first name was, because it was uh, yes. a British school. He was Mr. Wells, um, S.T.P. Wells. I remember he was tall and thin and he loved math. Um, unlike many math teachers in junior schools, he actually thought math was fun. Um, he had curious ideas about discipline. So I remember he did things you would never get away with nowadays. So I remember a class where there were two boys talking at the back, sitting across the row from each other. And they, mm -hmm. were, they were talking softly together while he was trying to explain something. So I remember he walked down the row, grabbed their two heads by the hair and banged them together. <sighs> um, that was not accepted practice now. Even um, even in such a school. Seems quite so. muscular to me. I remember my, my introduction to the school in probably in my first few weeks there. Um, there was a teacher who was the art teacher um, who was fairly sadistic. Huh. Um, and you weren't allowed to run in the changing room. So you changed for games, you hung up your clothes, you put on your sports clothes. Yes. You came back, you changed again. And if you ran in the changing room, you explained that was um, not allowed. So while we were changing back into our clothes, another boy stole my tie. Uh -huh. um, and there was a kind of partition down the middle of the changing room. And he and a boy the other side of the partition would throw the tie from one to the other. Right, and to I would torture kind of, you. I would kind of run around the partition right. to try and get it. And um, as I was trying to run around the partition to get my tie, this um, art teacher, it's curious, I remember that he was Catholic. Uh -huh. I think this is how prejudice really gets going. Um, and I've never forgiven Catholics for him. Um, <laughs> he came into the change room. I was running. So he grabbed me, he um, marched me down the corridor to the headmaster's office and he beat me with a bamboo cane um, quite severely. Um, my oh. trousers were still on, but he really, he really enjoyed it. Oh. Um, and I just remember a huge sense of grievance that he wouldn't listen to explanations. Yes. Um, I just remember being enormously aggrieved at him and at Catholics. Um, no, but I'm going to guess, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong, maybe even against authority. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I never liked which is, authority. Which is the I never larger... liked authority because of my father. But Ah, so you already had reason I already to challenge good, authority. Yes, I already had good reason to challenge authority. And it's like going to authority. show up later in your life. That's yeah. the only reason I underscored that. Oh, How are we going to get this um, oppressed young man, occasionally oppressed by this school, at a status at the end of his time there, where he is actually going to be admitted to Cambridge. How, how, how am I going to get him either intellectually or morally beyond this, this stage of life? Well, before we get there, All right, I, please. I, I have one more story I yes. think that um, you would like from that school, um, which is we had to have religious education, of course. It was got kind of Sunday school kind of religious education about how Jesus was good and, yes. um, and God would look after us. And I remember several things about it because, of course, the other kids all believed in God, um, some more than others. Um, 
I had a very intelligent friend there who, who believed in God. Uh -huh. um, and I remember during religious class, uh, the teacher saying, all good things come from God. And I would have been about eight or nine then. Yes. And I remember thinking that there was a problem. I don't remember how coherently I thought it, but um, there was a problem that um, she was only saying they came from God because they were good. And she couldn't use the fact that God, you couldn't sort of use this as evidence that God was good because you just assumed they came from God because they were good. So it was it's right. what you would call a circular argument now. <laughs> Um, I didn't know about circular arguments, but I knew there was something deeply suspicious about what she just said. Yes. And yeah. I guess I was in a mood to argue. I argued a lot. Um, I was very small, by the way. I was the smallest boy in the school. Ah. Um, the smallest and lightest. Um, yes, not an advantage. But I made up for it with arguing. Um, so I put up my hand and I, I tried to explain to her what was wrong with what she just said. Yes. And... I think she got frustrated and she said, okay, Hinton, where, where, do, where do you think all good things come from? A classic kind of parent move. Yes. Um, build, a, build an assumption into the question and yeah. leave the kid with the problem of dealing with it. Um, because of my father, I, um, I thought for a moment and said, Russia. Wow. Now, this wasn't what was expected in an English private school in the 1950s. This would have been kind of the mid-1950s. Yes. And when the Cold War was at its height. Um, and that kind of gave you an indication of how much I fitted in with the culture of the school. I've already had the indication, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I get you to Cambridge? Only because um, of the time. You can try. I can um, try. Uh, my, my parents tried. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's see. Um, when I used to question my parents later on about why on earth they insisted on my staying there, um, even though I was unhappy. Yes. Um, they said, well, the science teaching was good, dear. Um, and the science teaching was good. Was good. Um, Later on, I, I enjoyed the science lessons um, and I didn't enjoy the math much. Um, huh. I, when, in, when I was, before I got to the senior school, I enjoyed math. Um, but then there came a point when I just got confused about math, when they introduced functions. I didn't understand what functions were. Oh. I've been good at arithmetic and good at algebra. Yes. And now there were these things I didn't understand. Um, things like sine x. I didn't know what sine was. And I was always a very concrete thinker. I think in terms yes. of mechanical analogies. Yes. And I was actually, I felt unhappy with functions and not at home with them until I started programming when I was a graduate student. Oh. As soon as I started programming, a function was just a box. You gave it one thing and it gave you back something else. Um, but until then, I, I didn't really... I wasn't friends with functions, and that made math... I got worse and worse at math. Um, Can I but, generalize and say that if you don't understand its purpose, um, you challenge it or dismiss it? Uh, maybe I'm reaching too, too deep in your childhood for the later... I, I certainly want to... I, 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 I'm not happy with things until I understand them. Yes. And what I mean by understanding them I think it's the same as what Feynman meant. You could build one. You know, yes. you understand it well enough that you could build one. That's that's what I'm and, I'm wondering, and it, yeah. it sounds like that was it. And well, later on, that's exactly what I felt about um, psychology in general. That um, you know, I wanted to know what feelings were and what sensation was, and yes, and I felt you'd never really understand that until you could build one. And of course, would, many people say you couldn't build one, but and, um, that's just uh, nonsense. If we, if we make it to your current approach, um, you will not be sentimental about such terms uh, as feelings and emotions. But uh, we'll, get, we'll get there. I'm not sure what you mean by not being sentimental about I, I mean the, the hope that they are undefinable, not reproducible, human as opposed to 
something that you can analyze. You, you've been... Yeah, I wouldn't call that sentimental. Okay. I'd okay. call that just dumb. <laughs> Fair enough. I still haven't gotten you into Cambridge. No, you haven't. Um, so... You've got a good science teacher. Yeah, I had You're uh, suspicious several, about several, math. Good, several good science teachers. Yes. Um, and um, so I was good at science. I was okay at math. Um, and because my father had been to a particular college in Cambridge, yes. um, he wanted me to go there. Yes, fair and enough. And I sat the entrance exams and I did quite well in the exam, so I got in. Um, Did you surprise your school? Were they assuming you were clever at this point or not particularly? No, no, they knew I was fairly clever by then. Right. They knew I was clever but um, unruly. Yes, yes. Um, also might be true today. So uh, going on, going on, uh, you, you sit the exams, you get in. Um, I get in. I go to Cambridge. Yes. Um, it's a big shock because at school there were a few kids who were clever and interested in ideas. I had a friend called Inman Harvey, who was very clever. Mm -hmm. He got the top math scholarship at Trinity, which is the best place in math in Britain. Yes. Um, but mostly the kids, um, they weren't, their primary interest was not ideas. That's and weren't like they mostly influenced by the kinds of school you went to? Uh, in fact, I mean, this is... Sorry, at, the, at my... At my high school, what you would call a high school in ah, North America, I've, most of the kids were not interested. I, I, when I went I to Cambridge, everybody was clever. I see, I see, okay. Um, actually, not everybody. There were some medics I knew, but, but apart from that, yes. um, everybody was clever. Um, and that was a bit of a shock. It was very nice, yes. um, but also quite threatening. Yes, of course. So after I'd been there a month, I left. I found it um, too stressful. Yes. Um, and I went to London and did various odd jobs. Uh -huh. um, I read a lot of depressing literature, like Crime and Punishment and The Brothers uh, Karamazov. Yes. Yes. Um, I remember sitting on the London Tube, which is a fairly depressing place anyway, reading these depressing Russian novels. Um, I did various jobs. Um, I ended up getting very interested in architecture. Oh. And I reapplied to Cambridge to do architecture. And they let me back into the same college. Um, but before I got there, I'd done, I worked in an architect's office over the summer and I yes. discovered what the practice of architecture was like. Yes. I sort of imagined you'd sit there sketching out what wonderful buildings were going to be, were going to be like, um, or maybe new ways of constructing buildings. Um, actually, life in an architect's office consists of, you know, are we going to have cheap flooring or cheap door handles? Because one of them's got to be cheap, otherwise we won't meet the budget. Yes. Um, and so after I'd done architecture for a day, <laughs> I went to see my tutor and said I want to switch back to doing natural sciences and my tutor said okay which is a bit if i'm right about this one of the advantages of the oxbridge approach i mean they they can be flexible they can be very flexible um so my first year i did natural sciences and i think i was the only student in that year doing both physics and physiology oh. so i'd always been interested in biology oh. and I hadn't been allowed to do biology at school because my father wouldn't allow it. Um, he said they would teach me um, genetics and genetics was nonsense. Huh. Um, what he really meant by that was he was convinced that all sort of macroscopic observable traits would be caused by complex interactions of many genes. Yes. And yes. the sort of standard theory was, you know, blue eyes is caused by this gene and intelligence is caused by that gene. Yes. And of course, that was very much against communist teaching. Yes, it was. Um, and so for ideological reasons, I wasn't allowed to do biology <laughs> at school. Um, even though my father was a biologist. Huh. Um, he was a very good biologist in his way. Um, he got to be a member of the Royal Society. Yes. 
actually got to be a member of the Royal Society at age 49. And I got to be a member of the Royal Society at age 50, which was always <laughs> irritating to me. Um, so I was very competitive with my father. Anyway, We're, at Cambridge I did physics and physiology and yes. chemistry. Um, and physiology was really interesting. I'd never done... Um, it, was, it was stuff I didn't know anything about. Yes. Um, and I remember the highlight of the course was going to be the final term where they were going to teach us about the central nervous system. Yes. And I was, I, I was a very, very interested in how the brain worked because my friend in Mojave at school who um, was interested in how the brain worked and we yes. had discussions about it. Yes. Um, and I remember how disappointed I was when they taught us about the central nervous system because the way the central nervous system works is this. Um, there's neurons and they have axons yes. and electrical impulses travel down the axons um, and cause some chemicals to be released that get other neurons excited. Um, and they taught us a lot about how the electrical impulses travel down the neurons um, because that was the classic work of um, Hodgkin and Huxley. Um, and that was how the central nervous system worked. Um, I remember being immensely frustrated that they hadn't actually said anything about how it worked. I mean, they said how the impulses were um, propagated, but how did it actually work? It was just descriptive, basically. It, I mean, it was interesting that that's how neurons communicate yeah, with yeah. one another, but that wasn't what I meant by how it works. It, I wanted to know how, how the brain works and how that gives rise to emotions and sensations and so on. Why um, was that? if it was, such a radical thing to want to know. I mean... I, I don't think it was a radical thing to ah, want to know. Okay. I think lots of people want to know that. It's just that in physiology, yes. um, they didn't know. Okay. Um, so, so um, after my first year, I switched to philosophy because I thought philosophy would teach me more about those, the things I was really interested in. Ah. And that was a big mistake. Um, I'm, I remember learning about Wittgenstein and getting very depressed because I couldn't understand it. Um, later on, I think it was very useful to have learned that stuff. But really, um, no. I think my main, the main thing I got from a year of doing philosophy at Cambridge was um, I developed antibodies against philosophy. Um, although there was one philosopher there who I got along with extremely well, who um, actually, there are two of them. There's my tutor, someone called Jim Hopkins, who was um, a very nice guy and also interested in how the mind actually worked, although he didn't know either. Um, and then there was a philosopher called Bernard Williams. Yes. Who was a very good philosopher, later went to Berkeley. I never met him again, which was always a regret. He used to hold Monday evening on a sort of open house where you could go to his room if you were interested and just discuss philosophy for an hour or two. Oh. Um, and a number of people would turn up. And I got along with him very well. Um, he was a great figure, yes, I know about it. He was very eclectic, very, very fluid in his thinking. Yes. Um, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't dogmatic at all. Um, and he was just very interesting to, it was very interesting to learn from him. Um, and he would always take the students' ideas seriously and always have something interesting to say about them. He was never dismissive. So that was the one ph philosopher who I really appreciated. Um, then I got fed up with philosophy because it wasn't telling me what I wanted to know. And so I switched to, again to psychology. Is, is it fair to, just to finish the philosophy part, uh, is it that they're not asking interesting questions or that they are giving absurd no, they answers? No, they do ask interesting questions. Um, another philosopher I really like is Daniel Dennett, who definitely asks interesting questions. Okay. Um, they just don't have the apparatus to answer them. Okay. Um, my sort of methodological conclusion um, relates to why it is that philosophers 
sometimes at a conference will read their paper, whereas a scientist, very few scientists would do that. A scientist will get up and give a talk. Yes. And make some claims and tell you the evidence, maybe. Um, philosophers will read their papers um, and they'll sort of, the way they read them is significant. <laughs> so with philosophy, it's, um, it's how you say something that's important and the words you say it with, yes, yes. that's the content. And it's because there is no other content. So in, in philosophy, um, there's no difference between something sounding really good and something being good. Yes. There's no empirical test. Yes. In science, something can sound completely loopy, um, like acceleration is gravity. Yes. Um, and yet it can turn out to be true. Yes. And the things that science has established to be true are far crazier than anything any religious fanatic could dream up. Yeah. They're, they're outside the realm of the crazy things religious fanatics dream up. Huh. Um, they're always rather boring things like, you know, there's another world a bit like this one, but above the clouds where all the good people go. <laughs> right. um, they're, they're nothing like, you know, there might be black holes. Right. Right. So science establishes things that are far crazier than normal people could ever think of. Yes, yes, I understand. Um, and so this idea that scientists are kind of narrow is just crazy. Um, but the right. way it can do it is because it's got something out, outside of theorizing that can tell you um, whether these theories are right or not. Right. Okay. And I've heard people, I don't understand string theory, but I've heard people claiming that um, that borderline is being pushed by string theory where it's not quite clear whether it's all just mathematics or whether it really is being verified by data. Sometimes um, but, there's, there's, but on the whole, science has this independent test and philosophy doesn't. Isn't there sometimes the impulse, of, I may be thinking only of mathematics, to uh, speak and search for the elegant solution, which always surprises me as terminology because elegance is not necessarily truthful, but maybe that is the, the core of mathematical elegance. It's a very interesting argument about why, why should elegant things be true? Yes. Um, certainly if you look at physics, if you look at particles and things, you find kind of 15 particles which all fit into a nice pattern except there's a missing one. Yes. And the methodology of saying, well, we should search for that missing one because um, of all these symmetries, it must be there. That works. And the question is, why does that why work? Why does it work? So it's not clear that works in biology. So right. when I was a postdoc in San Diego, I got to know Francis Crick, who'd, who was yes. just become very interested in the brain. He was a very impressive thinker. Um, but he was of the opinion that um, this idea that the elegant thing is going to be true did not necessarily apply to biology. If philosophy isn't satisfying to the young undergraduate, um, I would then assume, given his future career, he would leap to the sciences. But in fact, he leapt to the social sciences, I think. No, no. Okay, um, help me, help me uh, understand. Cambridge psychology was a science, not a social science. Ah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, psychology's got these sort of two aspects to it. Um, but it was definitely the scientific aspect at Cambridge. So we learned about rats and we learned about signal ah, detection see. theory. So that's, you leapt to the rats. Well, I didn't want to leap to the rats, but that's what psychology was there. <laughs> right, right. Um, in fact, I actually was very annoyed that it wasn't teaching us anything about people. Ah. Um, and so I went to see my tutor, not my psychology tutor, but my sort of general tutor yes. at King's College, who was in charge of my welfare. Yes. Um, and I explained that the psychology course was um, not telling me anything about real psychology. For example, there was nothing about psychoanalysis in the psychology course. Yes. Um, and so what I would like to do is I'd like to go to London once a week and get a tutorial from an existential psychoanalyst so I could learn about that, because I was really interested really? in that. And I would like the college to pay for it. <laughs> um, and so my tutor, my tutor said, well, that sounds reasonable. So yes, the college will pay for that. Ah. Um, 
That's I, a real liberal ed education. That was yes. King's College, Cambridge, which was loaded. Um, uh, not only but loaded, was, but had the capacity to imagine doing that. Yeah. I mean, so, so the audacious undergraduate asked for it. The, the wealthy uh, college agreed. Yeah. And how important was that, actually? That So the only thing I re really remember about those tutorials in existential psychoanalysis um, was that the psychoanalyst had a really beautiful Japanese girlfriend, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, which made psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis seem very um, good idea. Um, but he taught me about Husserl and Heidegger, and um, I don't never really understood any of that. Um, didn't understand or couldn't be bothered? No, I tried. I just didn't didn't really understand. Yes. Um, I make the assumption that there was something there to be understood, but I... <laughs> which now you don't make anymore. Which I'm not sure I make anymore. Um, yeah. I'm, um, I, because we don't have very much time, I'm going to race you through your psychology course, but I'll, I'll stop at any point that seems critical in your, in your intellectual development. So, um, I just felt psychology was totally lacking in any idea of what a proper theory would look like. Oh, yes. they, didn't, they didn't sort of have the physics view that a theory should really explain something. Ah. Um, so it did have the experimental method, um, so it's better than philosophy in that sense. Right. But what they were using experiments for was to try and decide between theories that were sort of hopelessly inadequate and you could just dismiss out of hand without doing experiments because they yes, were yes. just not up to the job. Yes. Um, and so I had to do an experiment. Um, and I remember the experiment where you would take, you take children between three and five. Yes. And you try and decide whether um, they developed during that period in the sense that during that period they started paying more attention to shape and less attention to things like color and texture. So there's this model of little kids, which is the stimuli, like shape and color and texture, and they respond to stimuli. So this was behaviorist kind of psychology. Yes. Um, just beginning to get a little bit cognitive. Oh. Um, and the experiment was going to be decide, to decide if the strength of the response to shape increased and the strength of the response to color decreased. Um, and so you present them with three objects. During training, you give them, say, two triangles and a square, all of which are yellow, and they learn to pick out the odd one out, which is the square. Yes, um, yes. And then you give them, oh, I better get this right, you give them three triangles, one of which is red and the other two are yellow, and they learn to pick yes, out the yes, red triangle. I understand. Um, then once they've been trained like that, with various different stimulus dimensions, you then give them, um, a yellow triangle, a red triangle, and a yellow square. So now um, they've got a conflict. Are they going to pick out the old one based on color, or are they going to pick out the old one based on shape? Right. And you look to see what they do, and the hope is that as, as they get older, the older kids will use shape to, to pick the old one out, and the younger kids will use color. I'm not picking up a sense that you're impressed by this experiment. Well, here's what actually happened. Um, the experiment was going along, and then I got a bright five-year-old. Yes. Um, and the bright five-year-old, five um, the first time I showed him one of the conflicted ones, yes. where there wasn't a clear odd one out, yes. he pointed, so it would be a yellow triangle, a yellow square, and a red circle, he pointed at the red circle and said, you painted that one the wrong color. He thought I'd made a mistake, right? Ah, Because it was the old one out game and clearly I painted that one the wrong color. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, this, this, this organism that's meant to be um, modeled as responding to color or responding to shape. Yes. This organism has just done a piece of reasoning and said you painted that one the wrong color. 
that's just way beyond the scope of any of these theories. It's just ah. hugely complicated behavior compared with these theories. The, the organism sort of figured out I had intentions and that I made a mistake here. Um, it's just utterly out of the realm. I mean, it's as if you're trying to sort of model going to the moon by climbing up a stepladder, you know? Yes. The, 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 the theories they were dealing with stood no more chance of dealing with this kind of behavior than um, a stepladder would get you to the moon. And so that had a big effect on me. So you're, you're, you're disappointed by... I'm totally, totally um, disenchanted with psychology because although it's got an experimental method, it's using it um, in an incredibly naive way to test really dumb theories. <laughs> Wonderfully um, said. I, I, I have to get you, I'm sorry, I have to get you out of Cambridge right. and into your next step. And just the preface to that is, of course, because of those who might be listening, not really quite understanding the state of inquiry in um, artificial intelligence, computers, and so forth. How do you then map your next step? So then I became a carpenter for a year. I quit academia. Yes. Um, and then I got back into academia by working on a project studying child language development. Ah. Um, influenced a lot by Chomsky. Yes. Um, who claimed that, claimed on spurious mathematical grounds that um, uh, almost all language was innate. But yes. the syntactic aspects of language were innate, which is complete rubbish. Um, and the project was looking at a large section of young children in Bristol um, to look at their language development empirically by just measuring what happened. It happened at the same time as Watergate, this project. Uh -huh. And we had little jackets with radio microphones. So we put this little jacket on a kid, he would wear it all day, and we'd be broadcasting everything that the kid said. And inside the house, and everything that was said to the kid, and inside the house, it wasn't regarded as a bad thing back then. Um, inside the house, we had a recorder that um, every 20 minutes would take a one minute sample. Um, it would do that by having a cardboard disc that rotated very slowly and a notch in it and a little lever would fall and connect the tape recorder. Um, that's what technology was like then. And we would get these little samples of, child, of children's language. Um, and then we would try and analyze them. That was the problem. Um, but we got very interesting, the most interesting utterance we got um, was when we were looking at tags. So a tag is like, isn't he or aren't they or won't we? Right. And in English, tags have a lot of syntax in them. You don't just say n'est-ce pas or something like that. Right, right. You have... Um, and so we were looking at tags to see whether um, children don't express complicated grammatical structures very early on because it's too many phonemes yes. or because they just don't know these structures. And a yes. tag's very good because it's very few phonemes but has a lot of grammar in it. Yes. Um, and we got one kid, one parent, who said to her child, Santa don't give you no toys if you don't talk proper, isn't he? And I just thought that was a nice example of the kind of um, data that children got from which they learned to speak good English. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but you're not going to linger. You're going to move on. Um, so then I started a PhD in artificial intelligence because I well, thought, the, hey, such we a could thing was Such a, a, a program was possible. This was 1972. Yes. And they just set up a couple of years earlier, a big center for artificial intelligence in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. So the Science Research Council had decided to fund one big center in artificial intelligence. Ah. Um, and looking back, how was it structured? Does, does it impress you now in retrospect as to what they, they thought they were doing? I think it was a sensible thing to do. Okay. I think it was good policy um, to make one really good center. Mm -hmm. um, I think nearly all the people there um, 
believed in symbolic AI, good old fa what is now called good old fashioned symbolic AI. Right. Um, I think they were making a huge mistake. And the government, um, a few years later, I can't remember the exact time, um, probably 1974 or something like that, um, got a very eminent mathematician called Sir James Lighthill to do a report on the AI Centre. Yes, yes. And he produced a very damning report saying that, basically saying these guys didn't know what they were talking about. Um, there was an interchange with McCarthy, who was uh, one of the fathers of AI. Yes. Um, I remember the, seeing the interchange years later where um, McCarthy was saying, look, um, anything you can compute, you can compute with symbolic operations. So what we're doing must be right. Ah. And Lighthill was saying basically, yes, but you've no idea how the brain does that, which is the only vice we know that can think. And um, you've no idea whether this way of doing it is efficient. Um, now, retrospect, at the time, Everybody in AI in Britain was outraged that AI was now going to go through hard times because Sir James Lighthill didn't believe in oh. it. Um, I now think Lighthill was entirely correct um, because both sides were assuming something and both sides were assuming that computation wouldn't get millions of times faster than it was now. Yes. It might get thousands of times faster, but not millions of times faster. Yes. And under that assumption, Lighthill was completely correct that this symbolic way of doing things, although we're it, theoretically, you could do anything that way. With the speed of computation we had, there was no hope of doing things like perception and motor control. When was the report and where are you at the point with the report? I'm a graduate student. You then. are a graduate student at the time this pronouncement is made. Yes, and as a result of the pronouncement, so it must have been in 74, my advisor, who's one of the three professors who set up the um, AI, yes, the School of AI um, at Edinburgh, um, he leaves Edinburgh. Well, he leaves for several reasons. Um, personal conflict with one of the other main yes. protagonists was perhaps one of the reasons. Um, he left and went to Sussex and I went with him. You went with him. Um, Did you find your fellow graduate students bewildered by this analysis and you, you no, believing I didn't. it? Or? I don't remember. At the time, I think I thought Light Hill was um, too severe on AI too. Ah, ah. Um, there'd have been a lot of peer group pressure to believe that. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, I don't remember discussing yeah, it much with fellow students. Important. But you go, you go to Sussex then. Yes. This is before you've completed your degree. Yes. Ah. Yes. So I used to have to go back to Edinburgh for one day every term to sign a register to say that I lived in Edinburgh. Ah. Um, I would get a return ticket from, a day return from Brighton to Edinburgh. Extraordinary. Um, but somebody in Edinburgh is going to have to approve a yes. dissertation topic course. Yes. Who is that? Who's, who's lingering the, there that? There was a more junior guy in AI um, called Jim Howe, who was my official advisor. I see. But everybody knew it was just an arrangement. How did you work out the topic of the dissertation if that was? The term. So I wanted to work on neural networks and how they learned. Yes. But I couldn't figure out how they learned. Right. Um, I couldn't, that is, I couldn't figure out anything significantly improved over what was called the perceptron convergence theorem, which was already known in the early 60s, late 50s, right. early 60s. Neural so networks are in the air. I mean, ever since Turing, in a way. Uh, no, not so much. When I... My advisor had done neural networks until I arrived. Just before I arrived in Edinburgh, uh. he switched his views. Uh. So he had worked on holographic memories, which I was very interested in. And about when I arrived as a graduate student, um, he was very impressed by a thesis by Terry Winograd that was using symbolic AI Symbol methods yes. to try and understand natural language commands, like yes. put the red block on, on the green block in the blue box. Um, and he was very impressed by that. And he basically switched 
his interest from neural nets to symbolic AI. And he'd taken on this grad student who was clearly into neural nets and he oh. tried to convince me to switch my interest. But I wasn't having any. No, no, you're stubborn. I think um, I was very stubborn. <laughs> I remember him, when I look back on it, and having been an advisor of graduate students, yes, yes, and having seen the various types of graduate students there are, um, including the extremely stubborn ones, um, I remember him coming into my office when I was a grad student, and saying, "Jeffrey, I've had this idea that you might be interested in. Let me explain it to you." So he explained this idea to me that seemed moderately interesting. And at the end of the idea, he said, so Jeffrey, do you think you'd like to work on that? And I looked at him in amazement and said, no, no, I got ideas of my own I need to work on. Um, yes. So uh, he was very tolerant. Um, he was tolerant of having me as a graduate student, even though he thought I was doing crazy stuff. Is it possible and, to say he was charmed by your audacity, or is that no, no? <laughs> and uh, I would, we'd have arguments all the time. Okay, um, okay. And I kept agreeing that okay, if I hadn't made it work in six months, I would switch to doing symbolic AI. <sighs> and then I would keep reneging on those arguments. That's what he was tolerant of. Um, you were also unwilling, as part of your temperament, as as we we, we begin to understand it, um, to just go ahead and do the union card thing, uh, which is write whatever it is that the professor says do, do it, and then get on with your real life. You weren't prepared to do that. No, no, I, I mean, I wasn't going to work on ideas I didn't believe in. Yeah, you're not cynical. Yeah. I, I am quite cynical about a lot of things, but not, but not about that. that. Um, I still want you to, to get your degree. How, do you, how does that manage to happen? So in the end, um, I managed to do something that wasn't learning in neural nets, but was inference in neural nets. Um, and I made it work, and it had a little bit of math that justified it. Mm -hmm. And he was happy with that. Ah. Um, and so I got a PhD. And then I got out of there, and um, I was very disillusioned with it all by then. And I took another by the year field. off. Oh, by the university or the field? By academia. By academia itself. And um, So again, and you've done that before. Yeah. yeah. A, a I, I drop away. out frequently. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so I took a year off. I went to London and taught in a free school that was a very different environment. It yes. was a free school with a lot of disturbed children. Yes. Um, and then I went back, um, I probably took about six months off, then I went back and got a job as a postdoc. Um, Where? In Sussex. In Sussex. For a while. And finally, um, I saw an advertisement for a job in San Diego that seemed like a really nice job in cognitive science, um, where they were going to recruit six postdocs in various areas who were going to interact with one another and try and understand the mind. Um, One of the articles I've, I've read about you, not necessarily it's accurate, but said that the question of, of monetary support for work was also a factor in your going to America. Is that not true? Well, because of the Light Hill report, there were no jobs in AI in Britain. Oh, well, there, there it, it, it killed it, basically. It killed, it killed the, There was one job in AI at Edinburgh, and lots of very good people competing for it. So you almost didn't have a choice. No, I couldn't get I couldn't get an academic <sighs> academic job in Britain at all. There was no chance, um, zero chance. I, I couldn't even get an interview for an academic job. Wow. Now we're we're almost at the end, and the whole point of this interview is really the origins of your of your thinking. So that's not a problem. But I I wonder if we can get toward the end a kind of description of the academic environment in the American University and the, the sort of strategies that you encountered at that point when you went to San Diego? So it's a big contrast that in Britain, the academic establishment in AI was monolithic. There was sort of the correct view. Yes. And there wasn't room for multiple camps. Ah. And in America, at least you've got two coasts. So in linguistics, you had a sort of East Coast Chomsky camp right. and a West Coast um, Fillmore and Lakoff camp. Huh. Um, and it was the same with AI, that in San Diego there were a group of people, particularly David Rommelhart, 
who came from psychology, but was strong mathematically, um, who basically had a completely different view of AI. He was interested in how it actually happened in the mind, and he thought understanding how it happened in the brain would be useful for understanding that, right. unlike many psychologists. Um, and he just had a view that was extremely compatible with what I've been thinking. So it was the first time I've been somewhere, um, because Longer Higgins had changed his mind just before I arrived. Yes. Um, it was the first time I've been somewhere where I was working with someone who really had the same general beliefs about how to go about understanding the mind and what it was like as I did. And that was wonderful working with him. As, as we're toward the end of this, I may, I'm going to ask something that may be a ridiculous generalization, and I'm perfectly prepared to hear you say, say that. Um, but as, as people look at your career, there are some lessons, some draw about the stubborn persistence in an idea in the face of uh, most people saying it's nonsense. In America as well, and then maybe even into Canada, where, where you uh, later went, um, there was still an, an academy saying what you were interested in and what you were pursuing was wrong. Yes, but um, well, <laughs> I said a lot of bad things about psychology, but what happened was after backpropagation yes. had been rediscovered by Dave Rommelhart, yes. and he and I and various other people had shown it could do interesting things in terms of learning representations. Right. Um, there was a surge of interest, oh. which then died out within computer science because it didn't work as well as we'd hoped. But in psychology, people stayed interested in it. Oh. So it had a home in psychology and there was always support for these ideas in psychology. So you um, had people to talk yeah. to and with. Yeah. Um, um, although, on the whole, I was much more interested in making it solve problems like speech recognition and object recognition, which the psychologists weren't really doing very effectively. So I was interested in doing machine learning with it. Um, and the psychologists weren't really pushing that agenda. Right. So in that sense, you were relatively lonely. I, mean. right. I was relatively lonely, but there was definitely it, it would be completely incorrect to say I was a kind of lone voice in the wilderness. Right, I understand. There were a few other lone voices too, but the wilderness was the machine wil learning, not the whole, whole, um, the whole academic scene. That's going to be the last word. Thank you very much.